Vladimir Putin sets to illegally annex four occupied territories in Ukraine. Breaking news right now that has just hit our desk. Germany has officially halted the certification of Russia's Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Europe's mistakes start before the invasion of Ukraine, right? Where they say, we're gonna close our nuclear plants, we're gonna build a bunch of renewables, and we're also gonna get two fat ass pipelines from Russia. They were basically saying, we will hand over our energy sovereignty, where all someone has to do is put their elbow on the tap and lean a little bit to turn you into a developing country. <laughs> and that's what they did, and now they're paying for it. The West has already showed that it is ready to target Russia's energy industry. Today I'm announcing the United States is targeting the main artery of Russia's economy. The European Union and its partners are working to cripple Putin's ability to finance his war machine. Sanctions we imposed have generated two-thirds of the world joining us. They are profound sanctions. It's not a small conflict somewhere in the backwaters of the oceans, but it's really one of the global and determining conflicts of our time. One of the things that we saw happening, particularly in Europe after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, was a kind of acknowledgement for the first time that the so-called you know, decarbonization pathways, net zero pathways in Europe had a huge amount of gas in them. So really it was like renewables plus gas. And combined with the sort of energy security, geopolitical issues that, you know, have forced governments to sort of reevaluate those plans, and also the recognition that, you know, the cost of living crisis and the, you know, public concern about climate, I think we've seen a real shift now that we need to fill that gap with something else. So we need firm, dispatchable power. Russia is blackmailing us. Russia is using energy as a weapon. Europe needs to be ready. It's quite wrong to lay all the blame for the current difficulties on the invasion of Ukraine. That's the proximal cause. But why was the system so you know, dangerously fragile that the invasion of Ukraine could have these sorts of consequences? And the reason for that is you know, 20 years of mistaken climate policies beginning in the early 2000s, which took Britain off that gas to nuclear track and committed us to renewables. See, the problem with the renewables is that they really do need support. They're not thermodynamically competent. That means we've resorted to gas because coal has been ruled out as high emitting. So although we're consuming less gas than we used to overall, we have paradoxically become even more exposed to it because it is the single thread by which British security of supply now hangs. And I think the long game for Russia was to make Europe dependent on their energy so they could gobble up Ukraine, the breadbasket of the world. And the Europeans, their leaders, played right into it, in part because of green delusion, in part because of their own corruption. People who did not have a lot to do with those decisions are paying for it. Energy security, energy access, and climate change are some of the most important issues of our time. They all converge around electricity and the grid, and Russia's invasion of Ukraine brought all of those challenges into the foreground. The question facing nearly every country in Europe today is simple. What now? All of these countries are changing their minds, and in part they're changing their minds now because of energy security issues. It's really, you know, it's at the forefront. 
the policymakers are finally getting it, but the people themselves, right? I mean, people need to have their, you know, their electricity and their heat for the winter, and companies need to have all of those energy sources as well. All over Europe especially, opinion on nuclear energy has skyrocketed since the start of the Ukraine war. And it's very simple. Other sources of energy were suddenly cut off instead of slowly cut off. That led to an existential fear strong enough to sharply rebound public opinion. And we've seen no sign of this stopping. An astonishing upswing in opinion. And I don't think it will stop. Europe continues to not have access to the energy sources that were cut off at the start of that conflict. Europe continues to have existential fears about the energy they do buy that's either transit through third parties that are fine buying Russian energy or continuing to buy Russian energy while knowing they are directly funding an invasive war. They feel that and it feels more worrying than whatever lingering fears remain from the crib, from grade school, from growing up doing nuclear bomb drills. That fear is not as strong as being cold in the winter. I can envision the fork in the road that we're on as a civilization. Uh, there's the one path that probably a lot of your, your standard bear environmentalists would have us take, which is we use less energy and we, we try to conserve as much as we possibly can. And for the energy we still need, we blanket large sections of land with wind turbines or solar panels. So we have this low energy pathway that will result in millions of people staying in the low watt world where countries and most of the people in a country don't have enough energy to really flourish and have opportunities uh, in order to limit global warming to some degree. So we have this low energy pathway. And then we have the pathway of universal prosperity uh, that is afforded by nuclear energy. Energy is a complete game changer. It's time, it's opportunity, it's education, it's healthcare, it is everything. So thinking about what we have been able to overcome with such a small portion of our world living this very high energy modern lifestyle and what it could enable to have abundant, cheap, clean, sustainable power. Saying that nuclear is good is one thing, then actually creating a program, implementing it, building it, both at home and abroad, that's next level. We are not molding society around our energy, but we can mold society with our energy. And that's really exciting. What do you think about nuclear power? A nuclear renaissance. Speaking at a turbine factory in northeastern France Thursday, President Emmanuel Macron announced a plan to build up to 14 new nuclear power plants. A grassroots effort to prevent the closure of the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant is gaining momentum. Hundreds of people are rallying to keep the Beaver Valley nuclear plant up and running. It's crazy to shut down nuclear power plants. We view it as a force for energy independence and even peace. What if this technology offers our best hope for the future? For years, top climate scientists have been saying we need nuclear energy and lots of it. Back in 2013, James Hansen and three others declared, continued opposition to nuclear power threatens humanity's ability to avoid dangerous climate change. None of this will be easy, fast, or cheap, but nuclear is gaining traction all over the world. There's a hopeful sign that American politics is not totally impervious to the sobering influence of real world events. No politician wants to have blackouts on their records. That is a great way to get people to hate you, you know? Nobody really wants that. So part of it's that. Part of it's that we have a generational divide. There are millennials and Zoomers who did not grow up with the fears of the Cold War. You know, they're, they don't think of nuclear weapons when they think of nuclear power, they think of climate change. And that's a big change. And it's also really helpful to have a super hot Brazilian model saying nuclear is great. 
I don't think that would ever hurt nuclear, right? To me, this renaissance has several parts. One, the stopping of closing nuclear plants. People rallied in downtown San Luis Obispo today in support of keeping Diablo Canyon open. That fixed energy asset brings jobs and most importantly, carbon-free energy 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The movement has grown immensely over the last few years and I'm super excited to see a lot of new voices coming on the scene. And I think every nuclear advocate is important and every voice is important no matter how extreme, you know, like Michael Schellenberger can be kind of extreme, but he reaches a certain audience. You know, Paris Ortiz Wines is running Stand Up for Nuclear and she's built a huge global network of advocates. Paris Wines, Chris Kiefer, Maddie Hilly, Mark Nelson, Robert Bryce. So many people have stepped up to make this happen. One of the most satisfying ways we know we've been successful is when a nuclear plant that was slated for closure and to be replaced by fossil fuels, uh, resulting in thousands of, of job losses and you know five to 10 years uh, lost climate progress. When a nuclear plant that was slated for that gets saved as a result and extended. And we saw that happen early September of 2022 here with Diablo Canyon getting extended by five years. Uh, and we saw it again uh, after a two-year campaign in Illinois when Byron, Dresden, and LaSalle nuclear plants were saved in, in Illinois. What changed? Well, a series of successful nuclear plant saving campaigns in Illinois and California made it clear that for those young, dynamic, and ambitious Democratic governors, well-known presidential hopefuls, saving nuclear plants wasn't even a liability. It was a boon. It will be seen as a way to establish your credibility on climate, on the economy, on jobs, you just have to save your nuclear plants. I think that actually the public is ahead of politicians on this. You know, over half of Californians, far over half, want to keep Diablo Canyon online. In Illinois, most of the public understands the importance of nuclear power. Certainly the communities that host the plants do. So now it's time to show lawmakers that there is this desire for nuclear, that it is green, and that young people are asking for it. To see Democratic politicians, formerly leading voices in destroying the grid, destroying the nuclear plants, turn around and say, we need this nuclear plant for the economy, we need it for the climate, that's been astonishing. And I'm gonna be following that effort very closely. Welcome to CBS This Morning. We're talking about one of the great symbols of Paris and all of Western civilization. It is still standing this morning after a fire that nearly destroyed it. When I was working for Environmental Progress, Notre Dame caught on fire in France. And I remember reading pieces about how it was built in the first place. There was sort of a handing down of jobs the way you would hand down last names from father to son, right? So these are craftsmen, artisans, whatever, who are all committed over a long time horizon to complete a project some of them might not even see in its final form. And I thought that is the longest time horizon I can imagine other than maybe creating a constitution for a society. And then I thought about one of the things that people always say about nuclear, it takes too long to build. I thought, well, what if that isn't the big problem everybody says it is? I was like, you know, it's kind of so what? Like, it's worth it. I mean, they work, <laughs> you know, they do what they say on the tin. And then I thought like, well, there's sort of a value in that, right? Like, obviously we don't want to be fans of overages if we don't need them, but we might want to think longer than the next fiscal quarter. And then I thought about like the human capital it takes to build a nuclear plant and then another one after that, right? Because it's economies of repetition and scale all the way down. The more you do it, the cheaper it gets. 
I thought, man, like to do a big nuclear build out is a long lasting process that involves building this big industrial project at the heart of a community that can last, we don't even know how long, a century? I was like, that is an industrial cathedral to me. That is the same instinct that goes into building something like Notre Dame. This idea that it takes so long to build plants is confusing, considering we're going to need energy forever. You know, the best time to build nuclear plants was 10 years ago. The next best time is today. Now we've finally... There's a lot of barriers. The, I think the technical barriers are among the lowest for this massive build out of nuclear power. But there are policy barriers on state level, federal level, and regulatory barriers. And that's where advocacy comes in. The biggest barrier is the social and political support. There are other problems that we'll face down the road, and you know, there are gonna be massive growing pains. Take Vogel, for example. We stopped building nuclear for a long time in this country, and then we tried to restart our industry with a novel design that we had no experience building that wasn't even finished by the time they started on the project. I mean, that's just the reality of basically not having an industrial policy for decades. So there are gonna be growing pains and it's gonna be hard, but once you get past that, once you establish those supply chains, once you get people trained up and know how to build, it becomes easier every subsequent reactor. So I always say, you know, the U.S. can't afford to build another Vogel, but we can afford to build about 100 more. I think one of my big reflections was just having such an appreciation for, you know, what our ancestors have, have built, what they designed, what they engineered, and physically the large structures that they put together, and a kind of insecurity about my generation. You know, are we still capable of this? And that's really a question, you know, it's partially a question of, of finance, partially a question of political will, but fundamentally it's a question of human capacity. Labor and jobs and the workforce were such a critical role in the conversation of what our energy future looks like. And I think that's a really good model for what it should be going forward. You know, the people who actually have to physically maintain and deliver our energy system should have a outsized say in what it looks like because they know best. And that's why I'm particularly excited about the coal to nuclear transition, where you are going into communities that have powered this country for decades and saying, don't change what you're doing. Let's just figure out how we can upgrade your energy systems. It's not I think it's been framed as you need to give up your way of life, you need to give up your purpose, you need to give up and sacrifice for the greater good when actually it's like, no, what you're doing is incredible and we're gonna make it even better. And you're gonna have this renewed purpose for generations to come. Basically everybody in the federal government knows that we need nuclear now. They're admitting it behind closed doors. The question is how? I talk to everybody. I talk to energy ministers from Africa, Latin America, uh, Europe, and I see their hunger for nuclear. They are eager to, to benefit also, as others do. So, uh, and I think this factor uh, is essential because at the end of the day, uh, it takes political decision makers to really want it and to align their national policies in that direction. So this is something that really makes me think that this time could be the right one. I mean, there are so many beautiful stories about nuclear, and it's our choice whether to tell them accurately or tell them beautifully. Nuclear plants being marvels of engineering, cathedrals of power, or of nuclear workers being, being the the coal shovelers at the heart of the great cruise ship of humanity. It's kind of a, it is, it is in terms of a cathedral. Like, it sounds weird to, it's not a place of worship, 
but it's a place where you can appreciate, you know, the infrastructure that we've built that underpins all of the things we take for granted. What does it mean to do good in the world? The answer is just increasing human agency, allowing people the opportunities to explore, to find their passions, to, to do work beyond just surviving, because that's when the true beauty of humanity really shines. People are starting to recognize, realize the importance of nuclear energy. And that gives me hope because I see that we have a golden opportunity with nuclear energy to completely decarbonize the entire economy in a way that is equitable, in a way that we are going to bring everybody to the same standard of living that you and I are enjoying right now. I don't want to live in a society where excellence isn't possible. Nuclear is the most excellent type of power generation we can get. In late 2023, 25 nations agreed to triple global nuclear capacity by 2050. Remember though, global electricity demand isn't slowing down, it's doubling every two decades. The challenge is enormous. So is the opportunity. 